I'm Eric Chemi, and this is Politely Pushy. My guest today is Mario Juarez. He's the founder, the CEO of StoryCo. It's StoryCo. He's had a long career advising businesses, executives, nonprofits, so many major names, household names that you know and love, and helps them with their storytelling, right? Their corporate communications. How can you have transcendent storytelling? So I'm so glad that Mario is here with me today because I have, I have so many questions for you, Mario, about you know, storytelling, let's say in the recession era, right? Today's election yeah. day, storytelling as it relates to a campaign. Can can anybody do this? Can you improve anybody's ability to tell a story? And of course, your long career at Microsoft coming all the way from Alaska. I don't know how you started in Alaska, why you went to Alaska to be a journalist, then you know, almost three decades at Microsoft. So you saw that company grow. Certainly the story changed from 1990 to where we are today. So Mario, thank you so much for spending time with me today. Hey, it's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Your lighting looks really good. Your background, you know, anytime <laughs> someone has a has a good background, you think, oh, it must be fake. But I think yours is yours is actually real. It's the real deal. Yeah. I try to fill it up with Easter eggs. I do a lot of workshops over the Zoom era. I was doing all of my workshops and coaching via this camera and this screen. And I figured people need something better to look at than my face. I got a face for radio. How do you think storytelling has changed? In your career, because now with social media, we can all be storytellers, right? And and maybe that's for good or for worse. There's a lot of people, a lot of talent we didn't know about. They wouldn't have had an opportunity to show themselves. And now they can just be out there with their phone blasting to millions of people. Absolutely. On the flip side, there are a lot of people that think they're great storytellers and they should not be blasting to millions of people. <laughs> and yet they do. It's opened up, it's democratized yeah. for better or worse, the ability to tell stories. Whereas, you know, 30 years ago, you had to go through a lot of hoops, a lot of channels to to get your message out there. That's right. Yeah. Everyone is a publisher today. Everyone has some authority, minuscule though it may be, on the channels that we have. And of course, we've seen that create as much havoc as it has created wonderful outcomes. Uh, I think that everything has changed. You know, your question is such a huge one. How much has the world changed? Um, I think that with the advent of Facebook and social media, but I think also just changes in the culture and changes to the standards about the way people are entertained, the way people connect. Um, you know, it, it's interesting. Marshall McLuhan had the message, had the uh, the old adage of the medium is the message. And really, I think that's still true today. And the media have changed. But the fundamental dynamics of storytelling are, are universal. They've changed throughout the millennia as human civilizations and technologies have changed. And that remains constant today. I think what makes a good story and what energizes the, the dynamics of story that turn it into an influence model, that's remained constant. I don't think there's any change to that at all. The great storytellers in the media that we have today are just simply using that. How has it changed your advice? Has your advice been the same going back three decades or has it changed when you're doing your workshops, when you're talking to CEOs and you're talking to major brands, are the, what am I trying to say, the fundamental qualities of storytelling, are they, you know, constant forever, right? Are these sure. human qualities or is it just like, no, you know what? Like there's new platforms, there's new medium. This is, you got to keep evolving and a good story then is not a good story now and vice versa. Uh, the, the notion of a good story and the dynamics of good storytelling they've remained constant. Okay. The context has remained has changed dramatically. The channels through which we've changed. For example, when you look at the rise of social media, you know, we have small bits of time to capture people's attention and drive some level of engagement. I think what we really see is that in this world of splintering, the storytelling that happens is often done in splintered ways. And the stories, the things that gain traction are those that uh, don't close the loop of a narrative arc. And that in that, 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 that income. Say that again. They don't close the loop of a narrative arc. Talk about that. They don't close the loop of a narrative arc. I, I, there's a guy named Paul Zak in California who's been a, a friend and a mentor of mine. He's done a lot of interesting neuroscience work and research on the narrative process and what it is that drives narrative interest. One of his lines of business, one of his customers uh, has been Hollywood movie studios and they've hired him to help they're, him. They're, they're the storytellers. They're, 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 the story the, they're the message creators. So they're, they're hiring this guy to tell them what say they're the ones making billions of dollars. On, doing on one specific thing though, which is movie trailers, 
right? The tra- back when we used to go into movie theaters, this is all changing. Yeah, a lot of people remember there was a for a while you could just I'm sure you do now just watch trailers all day. Like remember like Apple TV. I remember some screen savers. Like you can just sit here and watch trailers all day long. We had a lot of people always joked, oh, the best stuff was in the trailer. Don't waste your time watching the movie. The studios would spend an enormous amount of money on the trailers and they would hire Paul to say, help us find the best trailer as we go through our testing, help us understand the attributes of what makes a great trailer. Now understand that a trailer has one job really, which is to drive interest in the first weekend, because that, again, this is back in the days of movie cinema and movies are changing, but this was, you know, circa two or three years ago, that first weekend, that was the box office. That's where they made their bank, right? They would bring, they would bring Paul in to help them understand what a right, what made for a good trailer. And here's what he discovered. The good trailers are the ones that open a narrative arc and they don't close it. In other words, they create this tension because they bring you into a world, they introduce you to a character, they bring about a problem, and then they leave you hanging. And that needs- So I need to go spend $15 to find out the answer. Even though you know that the protagonist isn't going to die, even though you know that that beautiful young couple, they're gonna end up together, even though you know we, we tend to be drawn to narratives just simply for the process of experiencing them, not because there's some mystery to be solved or some information that we can't get. We're just wired to this attraction of narratives. So in this splintered world of social media that we live in, look at how many great posts, how many great tweets, how many great messages you see that offer up a promise of a narrative arc and only a little bit of information that then makes you need to be more engaged to go to the box, you know, to go to the movie on the very first weekend and see what happens, see how that world unfolds, or simply to wait and see what the next post or the next message is, or to see how others respond to it, or to give you an invitation to respond. That's another change that we see is that the that the end user, you, the person at the screen, then can become a part of the story. You join that collective experience and this is again an ancient thing but it's unfolding today in a different way based on the technology that we're all using to have these connections can anybody be good at this i think about your decades with so many different companies but let's look at satya nadella for example right the ceo of microsoft as as you left there a few years ago you know was he a great storyteller from day one was there a lot of work put into there Can anyone, especially like engineers, right? Especially when you come from the tech world, that's not what they've been trained to do. That's not, let's say, what they're genetically good at. They're usually good at math and programming and algorithms and working by themselves. And, you know, the code is the story. I don't need to sell the story optically or, you know, using visionary approaches. I'm not that guy. I'm I'm an engineer. In the tech world, especially, you must find there's a little bit of this, this obstacle. But can anyone get there? Oh, everyone's already there. Everybody's there. If you have a human brain and a heartbeat, you're already a great storyteller. I mean, research shows- Why are some people so bad then? Because we get into these environments, you know, we get institutionalized. And as we get institutionalized through our lives, starting at school and getting into business, we come to believe that there's another language almost, that there's different standards. We have to talk a certain way. We have to adopt a certain language. We have to conform to a certain set of rules and bounds. And of course, this is all great and important and lovely. What happens to people, though, by my experience, is they sort of forget who they are. <laughs> they kind of have these corporate speak has derailed them. I might see this. We we all see it. Press yeah. releases, PR yeah. pitches. It's like, just send me an email that looks like you're talking human to human and yeah. not something that looks like 15 people on a committee wrote it for <laughs> no one to ever read it. Right. And isn't it amazing that we find that so hard to do? That we find it, it's actually, a, a, it feels like a huge risk to just speak in regular terms and use your own words, your own language. But as I say, you know, that's this one part of our lives in our, in our working world. But we all have our actual life, you know, our hearts and our dreams and the things that are meaningful to us. You know, the, even the most like uh, introverted scientists, the most, the most, 
um, you know, off on the spectrum, quiet person that you're going to meet. They're, they're magnificent storytellers when you get them in their element. I mean, we tell stories all day. Research shows that we do, you know, thousands. You've, you already today have engaged in probably over a thousand stories. And the most common of them is, is the daydream that lasts about 14 seconds. True. We tell stories to each other. We tell stories to ourselves. The narratives that we tell, I mean, that's a whole we other tell a lot of stories to ourselves about what went wrong or what could go right or what, you know, mm -hmm. all the, the possibilities of mm -hmm. the future. Yeah, often rather unconsciously. And it's an interesting, it's an interesting thread in its own right. But to the notion of how how business people speak, when I work with people, I sort of just get them in tune with their own language, their own it's not just about language, it's about a sense of meaning and a sense of purpose and 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 a kind of a confidence to be able to be a little bit creative. Really good storytelling takes you to a place of meaning. And that creates a uh, a great opportunity for real power. It also can be a, kind of a risk because then you're into the place of vulnerability. To your question, though, of can I do this with anybody? Yeah, I've I've really not met anyone that I can't work with and have them become uh, a conscious, competent presenter and communicator. Simply just introducing them to a core set of basic principles, what I call just walk away wisdom. Here's three things that you should just do. And if you do these three, three or four things, like you'll immediately be a better storyteller. Can you you'll share those with us right now? Sure. Uh, the one thing that I say first and foremost is to keep things really simple. Okay. This is a basic communi good communications hygiene. By simple though, I mean that you do much better as a communicator when you focus on specifics carefully not universally but when you spoke focus on specific details i mean really good stories begin with a detail and we don't really need it to be a complete detail we don't care if it makes sense as long as of course it takes us on a narrative journey that ultimately pays off but in the first analysis in those first seconds what you're really looking to do is provoke the brain and you provoke the brain with a detail that's rich in sensory information that involves human factors. Beginning a story with a detail about a place or a way a person looks or how an, a moment felt with descriptive concrete sensory language. That right there, if you just hold that as a standard, will transform the way that you present. People tend to present, they stand up, they say, hi, I'm so-and-so, and I'm here to talk about blah, 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 and you know we have these trends, and I want to thank the boss, and blah, 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 blah. You literally have about 10 seconds when you open a pre any verbal presentation, whether it's a stand-up keynote or just a uh, presentation to your team or even an interview or a casual but important meeting with someone in your business life, you got about 10 seconds. People make their decision in about 10 seconds whether or not they're going to engage with you and on what terms. We so could have a lot, than, you could have a lot fewer one-hour meetings then. You got... Oh. You got one minute and the meeting's over. We're either buying what you're selling or we're not. Right. And it takes, you know, this looks really, can look really casual. So, for example, in contrast to the person that stands up and says, I'm gonna, if you say, on my drive into work this morning, I almost hit a dog. Now, if you say that, suddenly everyone in the room's brains have been disrupted suddenly people are creating images in their minds. If you include information about smells or colors, that stimulates the brain. And now people are engaged. And of course, now the challenge is to take that interest and bring it on a narrative journey that takes people to a place where they are going to actually learn something and experience something collectively. That's the power of it. And it, as I say, it looks easy, but you have to be thoughtful and intentional. There's a ton in my workshops. The first quarter of the experience is not creativity or story principles at all. It's about scoping the story. Who are you, who are you talking to? You know, what, what are you trying to do? 
first and foremost, what is your outcome? Do you do you know do you have clarity on what that outcome is? How are you going to measure what success is? And then, you know, what are you going to talk about? What is the topic? And these are independent variables. These can be things that are bound together or are completely independent. And then who are you going to talk to? And that empathy piece, that ability to really understand your audience is really the critical factor. When you are good at empathy, then you change your reality to match what you know is going to appeal and resonate with that, that audience that you're looking to influence. And storytelling fundamentally is a value add exercise as opposed to a personal indulgence and aren't I great exercise. So good. I'm, I'm blown away. I'm listening to this. And I think the story that's in my head now is I should have started this podcast much better and we should <laughs> redo it. So how let's, let's use an example. How would I have started this podcast in a better way? Cause I did what you said. People just go and say, Hey, I'm here to talk to you today about these trends. And I've got Mario and Mario does this company and thanks for coming Mario. Right. What would have been a better way to start the podcast? Well, first of all, I would say that the way you started the podcast was fine in terms of the first 30 seconds or so, because that's expected and it's required. Hi, I'm Eric here, Let me introduce the guest. I think that coaching you, what I would say is spend, in a, 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 spend plenty of time researching me, the topic, and think of the first question that you're going to ask that's going to be unexpected mm, and a little bit okay. provocative. You know, you could say, hey, I saw, uh, you know, Mario, it's great to meet you. Listen, I was reading your, I was reading your blog on your website. And I have to know, when did you and your friends set the picnic table on fire? <laughs> though it's funny though, the, the two that stuck out to me when I was doing the research was, why did you go to Alaska? after you graduated college, why Alaska to start your journalism career? Mm -hmm. And number two, how bad was the environment in the Boy Scouts that you had to create an <laughs> underground newsletter? So I, I, I want to ask you that. And it's on my yeah, list. Well, why didn't you go there? See that I think that you're I'm afraid of derailing. I'm afraid of derailing the interview. If someone is like, I wasn't ready for that. Or like, I was here to talk more corporate, right? Yep. You have, this is where the work comes in. You are almost using that as a gambit to bring interest in. And of course, to immediately provide some sense of personality and color, a whole bunch of human factors in people's minds about this guy that you're talking to. Your job then is to be really thoughtful about the bridge that you're gonna build from that initial discussion. And you probably can have a pretty good guess of what it's gonna comprise. Then say thoughtfully through the questions that you ask, that you get us to the place of the things that you want to talk about. What is this business storytelling thing? What are the dynamics? How does it look? It's a graceful way to do it. And, you know, I can just tell from talking to you, you're a natural. You're, a, you're, you're great at this. You're really good at communication. I don't think that's a stretch for you. I think you almost need to be given the courage, you know, the permission to have the courage to be unexpected and to sometimes arrive in left field, right? say yeah. the thing. And people, people love that. But as I say, every time you break the expected, then you're making a promise to your audience that you're going to pay it off later by closing one loop True. or another. True. You know, it's really interesting. I don't know if you have kids, uh, but I have four little kids. The oldest is four. So it's, it's okay. chaotic here, but watching their development of how they're starting to piece together stories and, and closing those loops. And understand that they, if you, you, you know, the, the, the miracle is that you, know, you don't need to teach children about narrative structure. And when you tell a story and you say, the dog was hungry and the little girl forgot to bring him inside and he sat out there in the rain and you get up and walk away, your kid's going to go, what about the dog? Yeah. What about the dog? <laughs> what? You can't leave the dog out. Of, like a, a two-year-old right. will do that. Right. This is how inherent this narrative need is. It's really the way we, and, and there's a ton of really awesome research that shows that this is really truly how we're wired. This is, a, this is not an entertainment add-on. This right. is the core survival absolute evolutionary factor. It goes to what we were saying at the beginning, right? Is this 
the same core human fundamental advice or has it changed? And remember you said, no, it's, it's always the same. And it goes back to just our human wiring. We need to know. It, it reminds me of, we talk about unexpected, having permission to go there. Who's in the news right now? Elon Musk and Twitter, right? He's himself an unexpected character from what he says. And now he's running and owning a communications platform. So that has its own multiple avenues there. Donald Trump, half the people love him, half the people hate him, but he does unexpected things, right? That's a fact, right? He's not a typical politician. And I think that's what makes half the people love him and half the people hate them. When you look mm -hmm. at those two characters, like polarizing characters, do you appreciate the storytelling that they're able to do? Or are you, are you looking at them saying like, oh, you know, they could be better at their storytelling? No, they're, they're masters. They're phenomenal. And this takes us to a really important point is storytelling is just a tool. Uh, as or could be used for a, good or for bad as, yeah, as you want to use the tool. Yeah. Yeah. There's nothing, there's nothing less innocent than a story. A line that I heard in a podcast with a guy named Frank Rose, another really interesting uh, student scholar of of storytelling. Hey, listen, Fox News, the guy, you know, Rush Limbaugh, Donald Trump, they're amazing storytellers. Now, I personally find the way they use this wonderful thing to be rather reprehensible, but it's as old as civilization, the oldest you know, texts that we have all have characters that are misusing story. I mean, they're just, you know, could sit down and look at the news today and see 30 different versions of it. And some people are good and some people bad. And one person's good story is another person's bad story. There are no universals to it. But the dynamics of it, yeah, people who've learned power understand story it, it's 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 and there's you know of course the flip side is true too you get an abraham lincoln wins a war that arguably was not winnable there's you know fdr uh, you, you talked about satya nadella i want to go back to satya and I, I had the pleasure of working with him as his communications manager just before he became the ceo of microsoft and he was a guy who understood the power of story now, for him, becoming a great storyteller, which he absolutely is, you can argue that his, his, his value on storytelling is a major factor in taking the company up to a $2 trillion valuation or whatever it is now. And he had to work at it, but he inherently understands it. And he, it just took him a long time for him to take his own disposition and polish it enough and get good enough at it. And I'd say that's the other factor when you're asking yourself, how do I get good at this? What does it take for me to do that? It takes guidance. It takes a ton of practice and hard work, and it takes a lot of courage. It's not a, it's not a, it's not for the faint of heart, but we see great leaders. I don't really actually know many great leaders that aren't authentically good storytellers in their own style. And that's a really important factor. Big mistake that a lot of people make is they think that to become a good storyteller, they need to mimic someone else. One of the things that Satya did so brilliantly was understand himself and allow himself the time to cultivate an authentic voice. He's not trying to put on the t-shirt and look right. like Steve Jobs. He's not trying to be Bill Gates. He was himself. What did you learn in Alaska? I know I mentioned that a couple of times and, and it doesn't have to be long because I, I have so many more questions. I, I sort of need TikTok sized <laughs> one minute or less answers as I go through my lightning round here. Yeah. You know, when I was in Alaska, I was a daily news reporter, daily public radio news reporter. I had the amazing experience of being this was in the in the 80s. These were the salad days of the oil money and, and the state set up a bunch of radio stations in these little tiny bush towns all throughout Alaska. And then lo and behold, like created jobs. So I come out of college and I walk into this job and I'm the first guy that's ever done daily news in this little town of 2000 people full of rednecks and loggers and fishermen. And I had to do the news every day. And I, I didn't know that you couldn't do it. So I did a half hour newscast. I had a guy that lived over in Skagway across the water. I was in Haines, Alaska. My buddy Mike was the, uh, the, news, the news guy in Skagway. And we did a daily half hour news report. And I learned how to become a really good journalist. I learned how to be, I learned about storytelling and accountability. When you're in a small town, there's no anonymity. 
the person you tell the story about is in the grocery line. Right. In it's front personal. Of you. Everyone it's knows personal. everybody involved. The the yeah. subject of the story, the reporter of the story, the listener of the story, they all all three sides know each other. Yeah. And I I arrived with these great ideals. I was very idealistic and I tried really hard to be, you know, a fair, honest reporter. And I very quickly learned all about ethics and about accountability and making enemies and sticking to your guns and and actual guns over there. <laughs> you know, I'll tell you the thing that I learned though, this is really interesting, was that I even now I still very close to the place and I go up every summer and I visit my friends and I have a bunch of folks there that are on the far opposite end of the political spectrum. And I just think they're great. I'm just like, you guys are nuts, but I love these people. They are kind, good, salt of the earth people. And I think that was the biggest thing. The first thing that came to my mind when you asked the question, what did I learn was that nothing is simple. Human relations are complex I, I I weep and mourn. I, I deeply, deeply grieve the the divisions in the country. I have my thoughts about why we have them. But I Do they relate to storytelling. Hmm? Do those divisions relate to storytelling or no? Well, I mean, I think that just the country's in a place where there's great polarization. And and that that breaks my heart that there's this polarization because I think that it is not legitimate. I don't think that it's real. But do you I, think it's because of things like social media algorithms, cable news stations, where you hear the stories that you want to hear and you never hear the opposite side, so you get further to the edge and not closer to the middle? Sure. We live in an economy where in, enragement equals engagement. Right. So the more these right. channels can whip you up into a frenzy getting angry, they don't get you whipped up to say, let's find a solution. They say, let's go get the pitchfork. It's and everyone. you said, it's that narrative arc, right? It's actually the there's a loop missing because we didn't solve it. And we want you to be the solver, like you, the listener, the viewer with your pitchforks will yeah. solve the problem, right? Because we didn't actually provide a solution here on, you know, whatever TV show or article that mm -hmm. we read. The dynamic that's happening in these cases is tribalism and the need to feel a sense of belonging to something that is bigger than oneself. This is one of the reasons that storytelling is so powerful because it creates communities. Again, it's not tied to good or bad, it's just a dynamic. People today are wedded to these tribes that they've been told that they belong to. They may come out of their church, it may come out of their college or whatever. One thing that's interesting in research is that people are actually very good at spotting fake news. What they're also very good at is disregarding it in the service of a need to serve and be part of the community. The decisions that are being made today and people go to the voting booths, they're not, they're not about facts. They're about emotions and they're about a sense of belonging. We have, as a culture and as an economy, weaponized storytelling because it's great business. The side, the, the sad side effect is that it's also quite ironically made people miserable. And we have a huge rising deaths of despair. We have people, it's so ironic, right? We got these, these devices and they were supposed to connect us and we've never been lonelier. I think there's an epidemic of pure despair and loneliness and solitude. We are splintered. I think that's one of the reasons why my workshops tend to be these big things that are bigger than business. I, I've had a lot of people, a lot, a lot of people come to me after one of these things and say, that was such a transcendent experience for me. I, I feel different. I see, I've, I've had people that whole careers and trajectories have changed when they finally tuned into themselves and they, they realized how much noise was informing them and they ha weren't listening to your own inner voice. To be a really good storyteller, you have to be in touch with your own inner truth. And man, we lose that. We're invited to walk away from that. Companies say, just put that at the door. We'll tell you how to feel. We'll tell you what the values are. When people recapture that, it is empowering and it is absolutely awesome. It's you said the word transcendent and it goes mm -hmm. to something I wanted to ask you on your site. You mentioned yeah. transactional stories versus transcendent storytelling. Yeah. It's a fundamental well, part the of the difference it? I mean, because it feels like everything is a transaction, right? Like you said, we're all good at sussing out fake news, but when I watch a Ted talk or when I see a CEO speak, I know there's a transaction behind it, right? They're sure. trying to get me to do something in their benefit. 
Mm -hmm. And I mean, let's be clear, when we talk about strategic storytelling, we are actually ultimately looking to influence transactions, right. right? Buy the product, take this job, you know, collaborate with me, whatever the end end goal is. And this isn't cynical. This is just the way that it goes. The problem that most presenters have, the big mistake that people make, is they think that if they simply offer a description of a process or a functionality, that that will in itself be convincing. People will say, what, your widget does that? And they'll put together in their own mind what the value of it is. That notion of value takes us to this place of what is transcendent. And transcendent is how does human experience change because of that thing that you built, the widget, the, the product, the new feature. People are much more engaged by understanding, you know, my, my definition of a story is a story is an experience of human transformation. That's what we really care about is how did a person change when something bad happened, when there was a problem or a stress. When you have a transactional story, it's all about that human experience. Your product in a business sense or your thing, your topic is usually never the center of attention. It's a catalyst. It's the thing that makes the transformation possible. You can also have a great story about what happens if your thing isn't there and the transformation is disastrous. Very good. I like that you that you break that down. As we get into what's called the recession, clearly growth isn't what it was recently. Storytelling is going to play a big part because people are looking, companies are looking to spend less but get mm -hmm. still good results. And how how are the stories going to change, or how do they need to change to resonate? Hey, we're in a recession. Like the COVID was a good example. If you weren't talking about COVID, nobody wanted to hear your story, right? <laughs> no matter what your product was or what your industry was, how did it relate to keeping people safe or your employees safe or we're open for business or we're not or whatever, but it related to COVID. It feels like a lot of it's going to move in this mm -hmm. recession era. How, yeah. are you, how are you advising companies to adjust what they're talking about, how they're talking about? Well, I, I think that they have to be hyper-focused on value and understanding value as a as a comprehensive concept. It's not just about return on investment or uh, the, the, the quality, the cost of lower cost of goods or cost, you know, those things. Value is about how humans experience what you're offering. And you, the stories that need to be told need to be hyper-focused on an understanding of what that, let's say that it's a story to your customers and you're looking to, to tell stories from a marketing and a brand point of view. Well, you, you better know your customers. You better really hyper-focus. And it's not cynically just about putting you know, lipstick on the pig of your product. You need to know your customers so well that if you recognize that your stories aren't good, that you change your reality so the stories become good. Storytelling in that sense is a sort of an important litmus test. If you have great stories, it's easy to find story. Find, you know, go talk to your customers and ask them what their hopes and fears are and how does what you offer inform those things, either, you know, make them better or worse. And you begin there. You, 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 you focus on the customer first. Then you look at the human experiences surrounding your customers' uh, interactions with your product or the lack of what's happening in their life if if your product doesn't exist there you tell those stories that will that will light up your customers attract their interest and drive their engagement but note that you are not beginning with a description of the transaction which is your product <laughs> the thing that you do the money you know that is that is the default the other factor, too, is I think people are going to have to focus more on this. This We've lived in a world, you know, when come when the economy is big and booming and you got virtual monopolies all over the place. You know, the stories that a lot of companies are say is like, buy our stuff. What else are you going to do? I think that great innovation happens during recessions. I mean, this history proves this, that great companies are born in the middle of recessions. So I think it's an actual time for a huge amount of opportunity. It could be a big opportunity to do new things. Yeah. And then lastly, how should a company put it all together, right? Storytelling is one piece of a broader communications plan, PR, marketing, all of that. How does it, how does it all fit together? 
well, understand what you just said, the truth of that, that you really do need to be thoughtful about it. This isn't an add-on. This isn't something that, and I'm talking comprehensively just about great communications. It's not something that your great people are going to do in their spare time. If you're serious about it, you, you, you need to, you need to bring in professionals. You know, there's no company that's doing anything interesting in the world that shouldn't be thinking about how they're doing PR and how they're doing their marketing communications and what does their leadership communication look like and it, and, and view it comprehensively, view it across the, the span of channels that you've got, understand the media and communications landscape. It's changing rapidly. Facebook isn't the thing. I think Twitter is an open question. Everyone. Twitter is changing rapidly. Yeah, Facebook it is. is you know, and the world is going to TikTok. The yeah. social media world is is rapidly migrating to TikTok. Unless they ban it in America, right? Which then it creates new things. Right. So you have to be on top of it. And you probably can't do that yourself. You know, if you've got a company where IT is not a core competency, but it's critical to your success, you go out and you hire great IT people. If you care about a company and you're really looking to change the world, then you go out and get great communicators. And whether it's somebody like me or somebody like you or somebody that's running a design firm or whatever, understand that you need to make those investments intelligently and regard them as critical to your success. Mario, this is so good. I, I said, we're going to go for 20 minutes. We went twice that. I could go <laughs> another double. I, I need to spend more time with you because... This is just so much wisdom. I, it's I really, really cool stuff. And, you know, the greatest thing about it is when people dive into it, you're gaining new skills and all that stuff. But, man, it just feels so great. It's so much fun. Yeah. Mario, thank you so much for spending time with me today. You are quite welcome. Thank you to my guest and thanks for listening. Subscribe to get the latest episodes each week. And we'll see you next time.